I have a, a cutaway view, and I have to thank a lot of different manufacturers uh, for a lot of these different views that I'm putting up here. They're very difficult to come by. I've spent a long time trying to find some of these aids, so I, I have a whole host of people that I can, <laughs> that I can thank through uh, through all their manuals and what have you. This happens to be out of a De Laval manual. Um, this shows, again, a cutaway view. And in this case, it shows that the gear is below and the worm is above. Okay, on, on most of the equipment that we're dealing with, worms are below the gear. But it doesn't really change the terminology. If you take a look at this particular type of arrangement, it'll show that this is the worm OD. When they call the worm mean diameter, it means the pitch diameter as we, or the pitch circle that we talked about before. And this also shows the sectional cut of the gear. And let me again take this gear out and show you that this is what we're looking at. We're looking at this section of the gear, which represents it right here. Probably the most critical setting on any geared machine is the centering of the gear to the worm. That has to be probably the most critical setting. Um, certainly the backlash or the clearances that are set between the gear teeth must be the next most critical setting as well. But they go a step beyond this. When we manufacture, when a manufacturer makes gears, they try to simulate what type of loading is going to be, what those gear teeth are going to be seeing. If we did it by the textbooks, certainly we may not be too successful, but if we know that a gear is loaded, then certainly it's going to have some type of um, wiping pattern. Now, here we go in textbooks again. The mesh, if you, might, if you might remember what I said before, the mesh of gear teeth, the theoretical mesh is on the pitch line. And when we manufacture, that pitch line is just a very thin, shallow line. But when we put a load on it, especially in this industry where we load it tremendously, that line is no longer there. It turns into a wiping pattern, okay? Well, this particular diagram right here is gonna show you how the tooth, as the worm is turning, how it generates a certain amount of contact at different points of the gear tooth. And if you, if you might notice that it's turning up on the board, and let me just raise this up a bit so you can see it. It's turning in a counterclockwise direction. And as it's turning, it's actually putting a certain amount of pressure on different points of that gear tooth. And you'll see an actual representation in these wavy lines on the transition of that loading which develops a wiping pattern. Now there are good wiping patterns and bad wiping patterns. And this area right up above here is gonna show you, well they call it good tooth contact and poor tooth contact. As a gear, and we'll start with the good one first. As a, gear is, as a worm shaft is rotating, it's coming in and entering into the gear tooth. And if you kind of notice, in, on every one of these diagrams, they, they scribe a center line in here because they want you to be aware of where the center is of these gear teeth. Very, very important. It'd be nice if you could do that in the field, I guess, too, right? <laughs> but as it's entering, it's bringing in a film of lubricant. If you notice, it hasn't even touched that gear tooth as, as that worm tooth is entering into the gear. But it seems to be meshing after the center of, the, of that of, that, uh, uh, of those gears. If you take a look at this center mark right here, it's actually meshing or showing a contact just past the center. Now again, this is textbook. This is something that manufacturers, when they cut gears, they try to uh, develop in the way they cut their, their gear teeth to get that type of contact. After we load it up, it changes. Here shows a poor tooth contact. If you notice, just as soon as that worm is entering into the gear tooth, it's crashing into it. And when it comes into it, and it comes into it hard, it wipes off all the lubricant, and it, and it creates noise, vibration, and probably, in our industry, a big step right on the bronze gear. So the most critical setting that probably any elevator man will ever get involved with is setting up a worm in gear. And this should give you some sort of idea of what you're trying to shoot for. This is another wonderful diagram. If you look at it right here, you'll notice that you'll see a wiping pattern off to one side. And as the gear is turning around, the wiping pattern on the opposite side of that tooth is in the opposite direction. 
and it sort of supports this, this diagram up here. And that's what you want to be. You want to be a little bit off the center on one side. Okay? Now, if you're a little bit off the center on the wrong side, we'll put this diagram up so you can see it a little bit better. This is out of another repair manual. Some of you may even have one of these. I don't know. If you take a look at the very first patterning of the gear teeth, you'll notice that they call this an ideal setting. Now, this is a different manufacturer. As a matter of fact, this is an elevator manufacturer. The other one was not an elevator uh, gear manufacturer. It's just worm gearing. This shows more of what you probably see out in the field, or optimum of what you'd like to see out in the field. And that shows that if you notice, the wiping pattern is a little bit off the center here, and the wiping pattern is a little bit off the center there. Um, this area here represents the bottom of the gear tooth. So you have one gear tooth here and one gear tooth there, if you could all see that. Now, if, if I might just take you very quickly right down into pattern number eight, right over here, you'll notice that you have almost, a, almost the same situation, but totally opposite. That means that what we're doing here is we're, we're, we have a poor contact. It looks very similar, but it's totally opposite of what it should be. So just by turning what we call the helix angle, or moving the gear spider and, meshing, and getting those gears to mesh the opposite way, we have a completely different sounding and different operating elevator machine. It's sometimes very hard to visualize that. It may look like the proper wiping pattern, but if you turn it completely around, it will, it will really do the trick. And let, let me go through the sequence here. This being the ideal pattern, this being called a satisfactory setting. If you notice, it has the same sort of indication that it's doing the same thing. And very often on new machines, on new gears, we may end up with a, a wiping pattern that looks very close to the ideal setting and it's just starting to break through or wipe in areas that we'd like to see it wipe fully. In time, it will. It will break itself in. And this will probably turn into a wiping pattern such as this or this. But if I might show you once again, if you take a look at pattern three and take a look at pattern eight, do you see the corresponding similarities, but they're totally opposite? And one will run very nicely. The other one will generate a lot of heat and a lot of noise. It's not uncommon to have high spots. Um, I remember when, when we, uh, we first started uh, making replacement gears uh, for different manufacturers that we didn't even know what type of gear settings that they used and, and, and the character, characteristics of the machines. We used to actually, if I might show you, hit the corners all of the corners were wiping, and then the center was a little bit off. And what would happen is, after it ran itself in, we would get a complete wiping pattern. But it would have to run in. It was noisy. It generated some heat. But uh, we, we have since then avoided that type of situation, because it takes five years off the gear uh, once, it, once it starts running in. Uh, by now, with uh, a little bit more sophisticated machinery, uh, knowing a little bit more about the machines and, and repeating these from time, time after time, we've developed our own way of making these things work properly from the get-go. Okay, and that's just experience. Experience will do that for you. Uh, but it's not uncommon for uh, someone to come up with a gear for uh, a machine that we've never heard of before, that they've never heard of before, that they knew, need a new worm and gear, and make it and make it successfully. Um, and we feel that the more accurate we can make our gears, the easier it is for the for field personnel to install them and get them to run fairly decently. I, I, we always try and stay away, uh, stay away from lapping compound whenever possible. Um, it would be, for, for the way I see it, is a last, last resort type of measure. What lapping does is it really accelerates the wear process very quickly. And if you're not careful, it could really destroy the gears very quickly as well. It really depends on a certain amount of degree of, of being very careful with it. Uh, there are people that have used the wrong lapping compounds. Uh, they've used a, um, a carbide-based lapping compound, which embeds itself into the metal, which you'll never get out. Um, but we're not advocates of lapping. Uh, there are also sometimes people who will say, uh, put some sulfur in it. 
Uh, I remember a time years ago that we used to recommend that as well. Um, I see it as a placebo. I, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really help the situation out too much. If anything, it cakes, cakes up and, and tends to clog up oil ports and, and bearings and what have you. Um, my experience is if you can be patient enough and you have a, a patient enough customer that uh, you could let the machine run for a little while, um, that would be the best medicine for it, okay? Unless there's something drastically wrong with it. Um, sometimes I've even heard of people using break-in oils, uh, all kinds of different things. But if you just allow, if you take a good look at the wiping pattern of the gear and it doesn't look as if it's really that far off, certainly I would let it run. That, that, that's, been our best, that's been our best success. Let it run a while.